from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, and verse number 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. The rest of the verse would read that you should abstain from fornication. The first part of the verse is what I want to talk about. This is the will of God, your sanctification. <clears throat> now that word sanctification is a big word to a lot of people. And a lot of people admit they don't know what it means. <clears throat> it seems to me that a subject that's as important as this subject is a sanctification, we would take time somewhere along the way to try to, dis to, to discover what actually it means. <clears throat> I would say this. Some people have attended holiness churches for 10, 15 years, and they couldn't tell you to save them about what sanctification is. And when you tell them it's a second work of grace, they rather admit probably that's true, but then they really aren't sure. They can't tell you why there are two works of grace. <clears throat> it wouldn't be... Let me say it like this. You know, I cut all the shortcuts that I can take here this morning for a while at least. But let me, let me express to you this. <clears throat> when it comes to this matter of sanctification, let me plainly state it is a second definite instantaneous work of grace. If you really wanted to know what sanctification is, <clears throat> it would take you probably about 15 minutes to find out if you wanted to really know. I kindly arrive at a conclusion that some people aren't interested in knowing or they would have found out. If you've attended a hole in this church for a number of years and can't tell why there are two works of grace and what sanctification is, then maybe you need a good lesson in what in, in the way to find out what sanctification is. And let us talk to you about this matter of sanctification as God would help us and try to find out what it is. And I have a method that I use if I, if I come upon a subject that I'm not sure about. I have a method that I use to try to find out what it means if I'm in the study or office. And, and uh, I want to talk to you about that method. I keep a number of dictionaries, good dictionaries, on the shelves so that if I find something that I'm not sure about, I'll do my best to see if I can investigate it and discover what it means. And number one, I have a Webster's Dictionary and I'd like to read to you out of Webster's Dictionary what it says about the word sanctify. Sanctify is the root word of sanctification. And uh, let's see if we can discover together what it means, the word sanctification. And now I'm quoting from Webster's Dictionary. I know many of you are familiar with that book. Um, some of you wish he had died when he was a baby, but he didn't. So we have, a, we have a Webster's Dictionary. And it says, and I quote about the word sanctify, to make sacred or holy, to set apart to a holy or religious use, to consecrate by appropriate rites to hallow, unquote. Now he gives two definitions on the word sanctify, and I've quoted to you from the Webster's Dictionary the first definition. He says it means to make sacred or holy, to set apart to a holy or religious use. Maybe some of you say that's what I believe about sanctification. It means to be set apart for a holy or religious use. Well, I believe that too. But the, Mr. Webster gives another definition. And let me read to you, quote to you his second definition 
on the word sanctify, to make free from sin, to cleanse from moral corruption and pollution, to purify. John 17, 17, and I'm still quoting, John 17, 17 in theology, the act of God's grace by which the affections of men are purified are alienated from sin and the world and exalted to supreme love to God, unquote. Now he says the word sanctify means to be made free from sin. But you say, I don't believe you can. We're not discussing what you believe. We're trying to find out what the word sanctify means. And, it, and here Webster in his dictionary says, it means to be made free from sin. Let me ask you, how much sin can a person have and still be free from it? Let me ask again, how much cancer can I have and be free from cancer? Well, you say you couldn't have any, that you would be right. Well, how much sin can you have and be free from it? See, we don't deal very closely with the sin issues anymore, seemingly, in many, many places in these days. But Webster, in his dictionary, says it means to be made free from sin, to cleanse from moral corruption and pollution, to purify. And then he quotes John 17, 17, and he says it's the act of God's grace by which the affections of men are purified, are alienated from sin in the world, and exalted to supreme love to God. Is there anybody who would want to object to that? To being made free from sin? I don't think so. If, if you're going to be religious at all, why not try to get your theology straight and put it in right perspective as God would help us today? Now, I've quoted to you from Webster. Now, there's other dictionaries. We'll not take time to go through all the dictionaries, but let me quote to you what the standard dictionary says about the word sanctify. We'll try to arrive at a conclusion of what the word sanctify means. And now I'm quoting from standard dictionary at this time. It says, to make holy, rendered sacred, morally or spiritually pure, cleansed from sin. Sanctification, specifically in theology, the gracious work of the Holy Spirit, whereby the believer is freed from sin and exalted to holiness of heart and life. Unquote. Unqu according to, it, to the Standard Dictionary, he says here, it is an experience for believers, for believers not for sinners or backsliders, but it's for believers. Now, if it's for believers, that means it's a second experience. I don't have any trouble with sanctification being an experience for believers, and thus I believe it is a second definite work of grace. And, and he says in the dictionary, if you don't believe the Bible, believe what the dictionary says about it. You can, you can do that all right, it seems to me. And according to this, sanctification is an experience for believers, not for sinners. And that would make it a second work of grace. I don't have any quarrel with a second work of grace matter. Now, there are other dictionaries will not take time to quote what they say. But let me quote from some theologians and see if we can find the proper perspective here. You would expect me to quote from Mr. Wesley, and John Wesley, and he says, and I quote, sanctification in the proper sense is an instantaneous deliverance from all sin and includes power for us always to cleave to God, unquote. Now he says it's an instantaneous deliverance from all sin. Instantaneous, it's not growth, it's not but death. It's an inst Mr. Wesley says it's an instantaneous, that is, it happens in an instant. And that's exactly true, we believe in theology. It's, it happens in an instant and it delivers from all sin. God help us to find the solution to the sin problem. Sin is the big problem of our day. It's everywhere. 
in the church, out of the church, all around us. Sin is the big problem in our world. Sin's been your big problem in the past, your, your past life. Maybe you found deliverance from it, but we're talking about it this morning. So this is a definite matter of an experience that happens in an instant. Now let me go to Mr. Pope and quote him in his theological work. Mr. Pope was a Wesleyan theologian and is accepted on Christian doctrine in Methodism. And I quote from Pope's theology. Sanctification in its beginning process and final issues is the full eradication of the sin itself, which reigning in the unregenerate coexists with the new life in the regenerate and is abolished in the holy sanctified, unquote. Now he says very clearly here, tells us what sanctification is in his final issues is the full eradication of the sin itself which reigns in the unregenerate, coexists with the new life in the regenerate, but that nature of sin is abolished in the holy sanctified. Well, let's get our theology right as we go. Nothing like having theology that's straight. Now let me quote from Bishop Malu a bit here before we travel on further. Bishop Malu, the Methodist Episcopal Church, and I quote from him, from the very first years of my ministry to the present time, I have held with Adam Clark, Richard Watson, John Fletcher, and John Wesley that regeneration and entire sanctification are separate and distinct one from the other and therefore received at different times, both received by faith and the last, the privilege of every believer and the first experience is that is the, is the privilege of every penitent. Unquote. Now what we're saying about here, and he, he's referring to Adam Clark, Richard Watson, John Fletcher, and John Wesley. Four of the greatest theologians you'll ever read about. If you want to read theology, read the theology of those four great men. They're tremendous theologians. And he gives them the distinction of saying that regeneration and entire sanctification are separate and distinct separate and distinct one from the other and therefore received at different times. So you see, friends, the theology of the pilgrim holiness and the rest the other, the others, others of us who believe the same thing. We're, I want our people to know we are not following a false profession. I want our people to feel like we're on solid ground. If there's any Christian body of people anywhere in the world that wants to be solid, we want to be solid. We want to be right. We want our theological concept set right, and we will, we'll, we'll do our best to set it right. And he even invites us to think about Clark and Watson and Fletcher and Wesley, those four great theologians. And they all believe that, in, that regeneration and entire sanctification are separate and distinct works of grace. And regeneration is a privilege of penitence and, and sanctification is a privilege of those who make a complete consecration of their all and believe God to sanctify them wholly. God has a plan. God has a program. I want to find his plan in his program. I want all of us to find his plan in his program. If you're not sure that you're finding his plan in his program, anybody can come along with some false doctrine and two or three services have you so confused you wouldn't know whether you're going or coming. And that's what's the state of a lot of people who profess it. They're confused. They're not sure about it. When once you become sure that you're right, they have a pretty hard time changing your direction. And we need our direction right. We need to get our direction set. All oh, that God would help us. Matthew Henry's commentary says, It is the prayer of Christ for all that are his that they may be sanctified. Unquote. Jesus wants you to be sanctified. That's what we're talking about. Now, if we want to go to some further fact and some theologians, Samuel Rutherford, who was a Scottish Presbyterian divine, he said, Christ is more to be loved for giving us sanctification than justification 
It is in some respects greater love in him to sanctify than to justify, for he maketh us like himself in his own essential portraiture and image in sanctification. Friend, this is a definite, positive, instantaneous experience that will take in bread sin out of your heart and put you a further up the road in the image of Christ. Seems like everybody wants this. Really, if you want to fight sanctification, you'd have to misunderstand it in order to fight it. You wouldn't want to fight sanctification if you understand what it is. I heard about one man holding a meeting in some city and having quite a revival. People's getting to God and getting matters settled to take the whole in his way. And some of the people began to rise up against and oppose holiness and, and turn it down. And, and they were getting a group of men kind of lined up to go in and run that man out of town who was preaching holiness and getting people sanctified. And, and so they went to this one man and they said, and he's quite an outstanding man in the community. And they told him they wanted him to go with them to help him run the man out of town. He said, well, listen. I'll have nothing to do with it until I go and hear the man myself, and then I'll make up my own mind. If he's doing as bad as you say that he's doing, he ought to be run out of town. But he went to hear the preacher preach, and when he heard the preacher preach, he said, that's exactly what I believe. Really? Holiness is the thing to believe, friends. Entire sanctification is a definite second blessed, second experience of grace. And I'll tell you in a little bit why we need two works of grace. That isn't hard to tell. It doesn't take long to tell it. And yet some people have been around for years and they can't seem to understand what sanctification is. Really, it seemed to me Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Now let's, let's look at this a little closer if we can. No person can make an honest pretense I believe in the Bible and not believe in some sort of sanctification. For, in, for according to Cruden's Concordance, the word sanctify or sanctified or sanctification may be found at least 164 times in the Bible. So when a person declares that he does not believe in sanctification, he's not telling you that he believes the Bible. He believes, he believes something else. He's not willing to take what the Bible says if he doesn't believe in sanctification. If he believed what God's word said and God's word says this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And the word even is in italics in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. That means the translators inserted it to, to try to make it more understandable. But it seemed to not help this particular location there at that point. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, how would you oppose that? How would you, how would you raise up a standard against sanctification being scriptural and biblical? It's as clear in the Bible as it could be, it appears to me. As common theology, friends, when it comes to the matter, I really believe in the Bible. And as common theology preached by all who preach there, it would be common theology if ever preacher preached their, theology, their creed next Sunday, if the preachers in this county were to suddenly start to preach their church creed, they'd tell you what I'm telling you, that after you're converted, there remains a proclivity of sin, a nature of inbred sin. You were born with it. You're not responsible for, for having it. You're responsible if you let it remain there. But I tell you, there's a deliverance from that nature of inbred sin. Oh, that God would help us to get our theology right. When you get your theology settled and get it straight, you'll be more buoyant in your Christian life than you've ever been. This is not, this is not something that, that, that breaks you down and causes you to be wobbly in this world. No, if there's anything in this world that'll help you to walk straight and to square your shoulders and keep your head up, even in the midst of all the theological misconceptions of our day, is second blessing holiness. This is the best thing you can find. Always has been the best thing. It's the best thing you can find now. It's scriptural. You don't have to worry about it being scriptural. The Bible is clear. God has made it very clear in his book that this is his will. Oh, thank God for second blessing holiness. And biblical, as scriptural as it can be, thank God. 
And if ever a preacher in the county started to preach their, their creed, they'd tell you that after a person is converted, there is a nature of inbred sin. We're not the only ones that recognize that part of it. We recognize that, of course, but others do as well. If you'll read other people's discipline, church disciplines, you'll find that they believe that after a person is converted or forgiven of his sins, that, that there's a nature of inbred sin still in the heart. And that nature manifests itself in anger, in pride, in traits of worldliness. It's, there's a number of things to tell whether you, the nature of sin is, is burned out of your heart or not. So it would be common theology to say if, if other preachers preach their doctrine biblically, they'd preach what we're trying to preach here. They'd tell their people that God's will is for sanctification. Jesus suffered without the gate that he could sanctify the people with his own blood. He provided this plan. This is his program. It's his will. It's his order. It's his direction. It's clear in the Bible. And the Bible is our guidebook. If you want to learn how to play a game, get the game, get the rule book and read it and see what the rule book says. If you want to know about sanctification, get the rule book, the Bible, and read it and see what it says and believe what it says. And don't settle for anything less than what the Bible teaches. This is biblical. This is sound doctrine, friends. Solid as anything. As solid as it could be. Couldn't be more solid than what it is. And when once you get your feet on the promises and you become a seeker and God cleanses your heart from inbred sin, it's the best thing you ever could find. There ain't anything like it. This is the best thing in the world, theologically. And it's the only thing that'll get you to heaven. I tell you, friends, let's talk about that. We will talk about that some a little bit later, perhaps. If we do not get rid of carnality at regeneration, and if you didn't get rid of it at, at regeneration, you need to get rid of it. And you recognize you need to get rid of it. And God has provided a plan whereby you can get rid of that nature of inbred sin. And you'll have to get rid of it before you get to heaven. For no sin will ever be admitted to heaven. I mean no sin. I mean no sin. I don't care what church you come from. No sin is going to get into heaven. You don't get into heaven because you follow your church doctrine. You get into heaven because you follow the biblical doctrine. We need to put more emphasis on what the Bible says and less on maybe what other things are said. All churches would teach sanctification if they taught the Bible, of course. Now, there's six theories, and let me talk about these theories a little bit. The first theory on how to get sanctified, to show you that a lot of other churches have said there is a nature of inbred sin that remains after conversion, and then the many churches have devised the plan and program that they believe that you followed to get rid of that nature of inbred sin. Now let me, and we call them theories. Now let me tell you before I start on theories what a theory is. If, if a teacher in the public school teaches the theory of evolution, if he has one eighth of an inch of honesty about him, he tell those students this is the theory of evolution. I used to teach school. And when we taught that part, I emphasize the fact this is the theory of evolution. Now, a theory at anything is something that's unproven. It may be right, it may not be right. In other words, we don't know, they say. As, as, we, would, as we would emphasize at least, they do not know. And the, we, the first theory that I would talk to you about, about this matter of getting sanctified, is what is called in theology, the simultaneous theory, in this theological teaching at least. And, that whoever is justified is also sanctified, for they got it all when they were converted. Now that's contrary to the Bible. It's contrary to Christian experience. In every command and exhortation and prayer and promise in the Bible on sanctification is for Christians. And he declares that some of them, some of them were babes in Christ, but they were Christians. But they were still carnal as well, you remember. And every truly converted soul who's been converted for at least six months has probably felt the stirrings of carnality. After you get saved, if you didn't know 
that there was another experience of grace for you. It wouldn't be long as you walked in the light till you began to, dis to d discover something in your heart that ought not to be there. For under some kind of provocation, you felt an uprising, something in your heart that you didn't want there. And you, didn't, and you began to feel it and you began to be persuaded that there was something there that ought not to be there. I didn't understand sanctification. Been saved for quite a little while, several months, before I began to feel that there was something inside him that ought not to be there. I had a brother just older than me, and we were reared on the farm. And after we, as most boys do, had a spat every once in a while, you know. And after Jesus saved me, we didn't have no more spats. But one day, down in front of the old barn on the little farm, Something went wrong, and I felt an uprising. We didn't have a spat, but it, it could have developed into one, I guess. And, but uh, before I was converted, I felt like my brother was a lot of cause of the spats. And, but uh, after I got converted, we didn't have any more, so I concluded now that he wasn't near as much to blame as I thought he was for them. How he might have been, I was more to blame than I thought I was. But anyway, I felt that uprising in my heart. And uh, I look back now and I date the conviction for holiness, the second experience of grace or sanctification. I date my conviction for that at that point where I felt that uprising in my heart. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know it was a carnal nature. I didn't know we, 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 there's another work of grace. I had not yet heard about another work of grace. And, but anyway, we call the theory, the simultaneous theory, where they say they got it all at one experience. If somebody came into the meeting and said, after listening to the message she's preached, and finally they'd say, Brother Reagan, I believe I have the same kind of religion that you have. But uh, you tell me you had to go twice to an altar to get this. And, and God did it for me all at one time. Well, now, I have no reason to be combatant or difficult to get along with. And if he says he's got the same kind that I've got and, and he believes he does, then... I just simply say, well, I'd like to ask him a question or two. I'd like to talk to him. I'd like to ask him if he's told his wife about getting sanctified. At the same instant, God saved him. And I just might find out he has not told his wife. For I wouldn't be surprised if he's been saved long. He's had some shouting spells since he got saved. Now, I'm not talking about religious shouting spells. I'm talking about the other kind. One pastor went out to make a call on an, a couple of his church, and when he knocked at the front door, the wife, the husband had just gone out the back door to the, to the meat house back there, or smoke house, sometimes we call it in the Southland, and what you'd call them here, but out to the little storage house in the backyard. And, and the husband got to his door at that building about the time the pastor was knocking at the front door, and the, he had forgotten the key the husband had, so he called for his wife to bring him the key to that door. And she heard the knock at the door, and she ran to the door, and she was trying to, she saw it was a pastor, and she was trying to get the pastor in and kind of get him situated, and then she's going to take the key. And before she got the key out there, he called, the husband called back, and in no uncertain terms, he demanded that she get the key there and get it there quickly. Well, the pastor thought this would be a good time for him to appear right on the scene where the man was. And, and the pastor went out to see the man. And by the time the pastor got out to the little house, the man was singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. He saw he is in a tight problem. And maybe this man who said he got sanctified simultaneously with getting saved, if I ask him if he had told his wife about it, he may have been ashamed to tell his wife because he may have had some shouting spells at her since he professed to get saved. There's an uprising of that old carnal. When you have the carnal nature within, you can have an uprising. I'm not justifying it. No, no, no. I'm just telling you how it is, friends. Or if he were to say, yes, I've told my wife, I'd like to ask him, well, have you testified to it at prayer meeting, at your prayer meeting? Do you get up at your prayer meeting and tell the people that God not only has saved you, but he sanctified you and took out the nature of inbred sin? <clears throat> I think I mentioned earlier in the camp about an incident that some people would come to their pastor who's, that I knew real well, 
And the, they asked the pastor, said, Pastor, it would be all right for me to go to the county fair down to where the crops are the, and, and the exhibit of animals are displayed. And, and the pastor said, well, I suppose it's all right for you to go anywhere you want to go if you will keep your spiritual identity. If you do go to the county fair, then you ought to maybe say hallelujah every once in a while. Praise the Lord. Stop somebody and say, hey, did Jesus save you? Do you love Jesus? Are you, going to, are you serving the Lord? Just talk, keep your spiritual identity. But then the pastor said with a little sneer, for most of us, I expect we better stay away from the county fairs. For most of us have trouble keeping our spiritual identity at a holiness midweek prayer meeting. How few people testify they've been sanctified at midweek prayer services. How few people. There's some people who, who intend to testify to it. And when the testimony service is over, they haven't said one word about it. Not one word about it. how God sanctified them and cleansed their heart from sin. Nothing pleases the devil better than that kind of a witness, friends. And Satan fights this. I mean, he'll fight this tooth and toenail. He'll do everything he can to silence you on this matter of sanctification. Maybe you get clear on it at camp meeting and you go back home. They, they repose it. They fight it. They reject it. And they make fun of it. They make fun of you because you take the holiness way. And when you start aligning yourself with holiness standards, they, they get worse in their, in their problems and causing to you and criticiz criticizing you. So if the man said, I got the same kind of religion you have, good, let's shake hands, let's be friends. I can be friends with him. But when, when I tell them that I had to come a second time to get sanctified, they seem like they don't like that too well. They begin to be in opposition. They're not too friendly <clears throat> after they understand what I'm trying to tell them. Well, now, if I, I, I didn't write the Bible, and I didn't understand theology. And I would say this about it all, friends, when it comes to the matter of theological comprehension, I didn't comprehend it too fast. But let me tell you one thing, God the Holy Ghost got through to my heart and I knew, I knew there was something wrong in my experience and I knew that I had not backslidden I was attending midweek prayer meeting. I was going to church on Sunday. I was testifying, doing what I could to serve the Lord, reading the Bible, and praying every day till my heart was warmed. But really, friends, this matter of people saying simultaneously sanctified. I've been hear hearing testimonies for a long, long time now, better than 60 years since Jesus saved me. And, uh, and I've never heard anybody anybody at, at midweek prayer meeting or otherwise so far as that's concerned I've never heard anybody say they got sanctified by the simultaneous method or theory theory the theory is something unproven they don't know it's right it may be right it may not be right they just don't know that's what a theory is well, let me talk to you about the second theory that sometime we talk about when we after we get through talking about the simultaneous theory then we're interested in tackling the other, the other kind that we sometimes talk about, and we talk about getting it by growth. Some people, some church, one church has said particularly in their theological compend that uh, you get this experience by growth. You grow into it. You grow into it. Well, that's, that's rather foolish, it seems to me. You cannot grow weeds out of the garden. Now, there's a method to get the weeds out, but you don't, it's not to grow the mountain. That's not the way you get a mountain. Yeah, you can get rid of sin, but you can't grow sin out of the heart. That's not the way you have to deal with sin. It takes something different. In order to take care of the sin problem, God's got a method, but it's not the growth method, friends. You can't grow impurity out of the heart. You can grow, you can grow in grace, and time's a great element, but you can't grow into the experiences of grace. You don't grow into the experience of getting sanctified. No, no. It's a definite, positive, instantaneous experience called sanctification. There's other terminologies for it. And 
I don't see any reason to change terminologies and create new words to try to express it. Just use the old biblical terms relative to that nature of inverted sin and talk about it not being subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. It's an outlaw. You've got an outlaw in your heart even after you get converted. And that old outlaw, that old nature of inverted sin will backslide you faster than you think it can. You'll discover, you will discover how awful it is as you go along. Now, if it's by growth, let's, let's, let's do a little talk about it. If we do get sanctified by growth, then we ought to be able to establish how long it would take to grow into this experience. Now, if, if we were trying to, to discuss how long it would take a person to grow into this experience of holiness or sanctification, Maybe we could set a two-year frame, frame time to it and say in two years you ought to grow into this experience. After growing two years, you still haven't arrived. Have you arrived? No, I haven't. Did you arrive at sanctification? Not yet. Not yet. Well, let's, we, we could have to reconsider then probably. But the truth of the case is, friends, this is plainly a divine work and not a growth in grace theory. It is not by growth in grace. Now the third theory, let me mention it quickly, and they, they tell us it takes place in death. This is the theory, and some churches teach this. You get sanctified in the article of death. You get saved, you grow in grace, you mind the Lord, you travel along and finally find it. No use to seek it now because you can't get it now according to their teaching. You have to wait till you die. Then bless the undertaker. The sooner he comes, the better it might be. For the sooner you get sanctified, the better it is. Seem to me. We say, well, let's, let us get it as soon as we can, whatever method we have. But if it's the dead theory, I tell you, friend, death, is death a sanctifier? No, not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, death is an enemy. Death's an enemy. Hear me, friends. You don't get sanctified by death. If death was a sanctifier, it just might be a savior. So you would have to worry about anything. Just wait till death, and then it'll all be corrected. But that's not the way we do it. That's not the way the Bible talks about either, friends. Oh, no, it isn't. Death's an awful, death's an awful thing. And death's an enemy. It's not a friend. You heard about the Presbyterian preacher's wife, and their theory was you get sanctified in the article of death. She was very sick, and she knew she was about to die. She called her husband. He said, Husband, would you please, please ask some of the people to come in and let's pray for her, have a healing service. He said, I'm about to die, and I'm not sanctified. I want to get sanctified. But they believed you couldn't get sanctified until you died. And she thought she was about to die, and she wanted prayer. And so they prayed for her, and God reached down from heaven and healed her, and she got up out of the bed. God sanctified her holy, and she lived for several years, testified to what God had done for her, clear and cut, definitely. God had sanctified her, cleansed her heart from sin, filled her heart with the Holy Spirit, and she was happy in the Lord for a number of years before she did die. Yeah, my friends, you don't get it at death. Oh, that's not the method. Death doesn't sanctify you. Death doesn't save you either, friends. The next theory I would talk about, and they call it purgatory. Now, there's been a teaching by the church, the Catholic Church. You get sanctified at purgatory. You get the nature of sin. For purgatory, according to their, according to their teaching, is, is the place where you take care, not of your actual transgressions, the priest is supposed to have absolved you of your actual sins, your actual transgressions, and they have devised a purgatorial plan, theory, in order to get money in their coffers to catch a, a people who's unwitting, of course, to try to get them to pay money in, into the church. And there's only one thing about the purgatorial teaching that I, that I would remind you about, and that is, it's the fires of purgatory, the fire of purgatory. Now, it does take fire. It does take fire to deal with that nature of sin, but not purgatorial fire. That's all a farce. It takes Holy Ghost fire to burn out that nature of inbred sin. 
Holy Ghost fire will burn out that nature of inbred sin and cleanse your heart so clean until you know the work is done and you can testify to it at prayer meeting and tell your friends and your family, God the Holy Ghost has come to abide and has sanctified you holy. Now I know what the world about you and your friends say, boys, that's a pretty big testimony you give when you give that. Well, it is a big testimony, but it's, it's true. It's a wonderful testimony, no question about it. And then let me talk about one more theory, and we'll make a change in the directions at that point. And we call it the Calvinistic Keswickian Antinomian Theory, which is repression and imputed holiness, and as opposed to the Wesleyan teaching of eradication of inbred sin and the imparted holiness. And now the holiness movement we teach that God burns out the nature of inbred sin and then helps you to live a holy life, actually live a holy life. And now all these others, the, the Calvinists and the Antinomians and these that I just mentioned, the Calvinistic and the Keswicks and the Antinomians, they say that you never really made holy never really made holy. That's their theory. That's their teaching, of course. And, they, and since you're not made holy, that means you're not living holy. And they don't call it actual holiness. It's imputed holiness. And God counts you holy. Their teaching is that since Jesus saved me, I came to Jesus. I brought my case to him. He saved me from sin. He saved me, forgave me of my sins. And when God looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus because I'm in Jesus and he counts me holy. Not that I'm holy, but he counts me holy. I went to a Keswick convention to see how they did. And they talked about getting saved. Of course they talked about getting saved. But then they talked about uh, that something that was in our hearts after we got saved. And I mean, several of them talked about it and gave it a pretty ugly picture, pretty much like it was. But they faded when it comes to actually getting the experience. One man, he was preaching, and this is about what he said, not verbatim, but oh, nearly, fairly close to it at least. And he said he went to a place to hold a convention. And they put him in a motel to stay in a motel, and he said, outside the window of the motel, there's a lot of debris. I've forgotten whether he'd identified what the debris was, maybe scrap paper, wind had blown in, maybe his weeds grown up, may have been broken blocks. I'd have forgotten what he said about that part. But he said a pretty ugly sight just outside of his window. And one night while he was sleeping, a beautiful snow fell and covered all that debris. And he said, the next morning when I awakened and looked out, I didn't see the debris. It was still out there, but the snow had covered it. And he said, that's the, just the way we are when we're in Christ. That, that debris is still there in our hearts, but they count, they, God counts us holy in Christ. That stuff is still wrong in our lives. Well, now hear me, friends. I followed, I followed this way a good while, and I've never heard anybody testify that they got sanctified by the simultaneous theory, nor by the growth theory, nor by the death theory, nor by the purgatorial theory, nor this theory just kind of God counts us holy and doesn't make us holy. No, sir. I've never, heard, I've never heard anybody testify that they got through to the blessing of holiness like that. Now, if that's true, then there must be a way to get the real experience, the real grace of holiness. And a theory is something that's unproven. It may be right, it may be wrong. They don't know. Now, let's remove this from that theory category and let me talk to you a few minutes about the next part. <clears throat> if people testified to being saved and sanctified and they testified to the growth theory or the death theory or any other theory, any of the theories, the, anything beside the true way. And a lot of people, if they ever testify to holiness, they'd have to testify to that because their lives are not holy. I've never heard of anybody testifying to growing into the experience. I've concluded if that had been the right way, if these theory, theories that I've been talking, if that was the right way to get the blessing of holiness, real sanctification, I believe I'd have heard somebody say something about it before now. It's been 60 years and better since it started. 
And I've been listening to testimonies for a long time. I never heard anybody testify that that's the way they obtained the blessing. But I've heard hundreds of people get up and testify how God the Holy Ghost convicted them of their sins. And they came to an altar and they repented of their sins. And God the Holy Ghost forgave them of their sins. And then turned the light on and they saw they had another need. And they came to an altar and met the conditions. And God cleansed their heart. And they shout the victory and have a hoopy time while they're doing it. Oh, friends, I tell you, I believe there's a genuine experience of holiness. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God. And it's an experience that's subsequent to regeneration and conditioned upon entire, entire consecration and faith. And it's the privilege of every believer to, be, to have this experience in his life. And, and there's people here today who gladly testify to any court how God did the work for them. And if I were to tell it in as few words and you were to tell it in as few words as you could, it would have to go something like this. One day, God found me on the, far out on the mountain of sin and he wooed my heart. He talked to me. He brought me in. I came in that little Methodist church just as a boy, a little revival meeting on. And I found my way to a mortar's bench, and gee, I repented the best I knew how, and God, for Jesus' sake, forgave me. I started out to serve the Lord. It wasn't too long till I discovered there was something wrong. I said to two preachers, something's wrong with my experience. I know I haven't backslidden, and I knew I had not. And one preacher said, Bud, you pray, and God will help you to know what it is. And I did pray, and God did help me to know what it is. And and then there came a time when I went to the altar to get sanctified holy. The first night, I did not get through. The second night, I came back. I was there the second night. I purposed under God, I'd have the blessing. And God, the Holy Ghost, said to me while I was kneeling at the altar that night, a passage of Scripture, I didn't know it was biblical. And the question God asked me, will you abstain from all appearance of evil? And I, I didn't fully understand all that was involved in that question, but I promised God out of a sincere heart I would abstain from all the appearance of evil. And that's been about nearly 60 years ago. And I tell you, I've tried to keep that part of my covenant with God. We've lived, we've reared a family, and there's been a lot of things we have had that pe a lot of people haven't had We've had God, but there's been a lot of other things we didn't have. We never did get a television. Didn't want one. Didn't have any need of one. I didn't feel I could be the right influence as the head of a family for me to put a television in. And we got by without it. We did very good. We come along all right. And I kept the blessing of holiness all the way through, Sister Reagan. We've had a happy, happy home, happy life. I'd like to witness to the fact this way of holiness is the best thing I ever found, friend. I mean, it's the best thing that I ever found. It's the best thing. It's the best thing for me. It's the best, best thing for my family. It's the best thing for you, best thing for your family. I don't know whether you've abstained from all the appearance of evil or not. There's a lot of things you don't want when you're, when you're abstaining from all the appearance of evil. I want to keep my record clear so if the call comes for the glory world, I'll be ready without having to repair it before I go. I want to stay ready for the soon coming Christ. Then. You say, could you tell us quickly how to get the experience? Let me try it at least. And if you want to know how to get the experience, let me... Let me give you some general directions. You go to the first epistle of Thessalonians and go over to chapter number 5 and, and start in about verse number 16, maybe verse number 15. We ought to start. If you, if you want to take it step by step and you say, well, I know there's a nature of inbred sin in my heart. Something's wrong. I need help. And, and here's a way to find your way through. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 15. See that none render evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. <clears throat> now let me start at verse 14. Now exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. 
And it's a little difficult sometimes to, to always know who the feeble-minded are, you know. But he says, comfort the feeble-minded, whoever they are. Support the weak. Be patient toward all. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. He's telling them how to get sanctified in this epistle. The last part of it here. He's telling them how to get sanctified. He told them this is the will of God, your, your sanctification. And now he's spelling it out clearly for them. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Well, you say, they killed my dog and I'm going to kill their cat if it's the last thing I ever do. Well, you may do that, but you won't get sanctified with that. Oh, no, friends. If you're returning evil for evil, you're not, you're not going to get sanctified. I mean, you've got to reach the place where you're willing to return good for evil. If they treat you bad, you don't treat them bad. They talk ugly about you, don't you talk ugly about them? If you do, you're as bad as they are, regardless of what you may profess. And, but he says, don't render evil unto, unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And the next verse, verse 16 says, rejoice evermore. The lowest watermark of old time religion is joy. If you've lost joy, you've lost God out of your heart. Identify yourself with this thing. Let's look this matter over clearly. Rejoice evermore. Shout the victory. Praise God. If you feel like shouting, then shout. The devil said, be quiet. Don't listen to the Satan. You take your liberty in the Lord. Do what God the Holy Ghost would have you do. I went to a place and one woman said, Brother Egan, find a minded God. I was shouting all over the place. I said, Sister, you should have done it. You should have done it. God knows better how to run this program than I do. You should have shouted. I was reminded of a meeting that I was in and one dear old man, he was rather feeble. He was rather tottery. And uh, he, was, uh, he was given to testifying frequently. And he stood up one night to testify. He was a bit tottery and a bit feeble. And, and as he tried to testify, he kept having trouble with his false teeth. And finally, he just reached up and took them out and put them in his pocket and began to weep and said, I'll be so glad when I get to heaven. I won't have to fool with these things. But then he said, I feel like I need to say you a little song. And I mean, I'm not going to tell you he was a handsome young man. No, 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 no. He wasn't. A, he's feeble. His his, his teeth was out. And he, he just wasn't as handsome as I could talk about him. But I tell you, when he started to sing that little song, before he had finished the first verse, the whole atmosphere was electrified. God, the Holy Ghost fell on that meeting. God moved. What we need is the presence of the divine, friends. We don't need more learning. We need the presence of the divine, the blessed Holy Ghost on the sea. Mind the Lord. Mind the Lord. And he said, rejoice evermore. He's telling them how to get sanctified. If you have joy, give expression to it. Give expression. Open up and let go and let God have his way. If you want to say amen, say amen. If you want to say praise God, say praise God. If you want to take a trip down the aisle, take a trip down the aisle. Let go and let God have his way. And the next thing he said, pray without ceasing. He's telling them how to get sanctified. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean to stay on your knees all the time. It does mean to keep a channel open to, between you and God all the time. Keep a channel open. Don't let that channel get clogged. If you begin to discover it, that channel's clogged, you get it unclogged. Stop right then. Don't keep it going and wait till camp meeting time comes. No, no. Yeah, I mean, you need to get the channel open immediately. So he said there, said, just pray without ceasing. And then he said, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You say, I don't know about that one. <coughs> I'm not sure that, you say, I'm not sure I can, that I can really do that in everything give thanks. <coughs> for I fell down and broke my arm. Does that mean I'm supposed to thank God I wrote Barb? No, no, no. That's not what he's saying. I believe what he's actually saying is, if you were to fall down and break your arm, thank God 
it wasn't your deck you broke. And keep on going. Keep on, keep the victory. Whatever happened, you could have been worse than what it was. Thank God that whatever happened was no worse than what it was. And keep the victory. Remember, he's telling them how to get sanctified. He said, yeah, give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then he says, quench not the spirit. I wish we'd take some lessons somewhere along the way on this matter. Don't you quench the spirit. Don't you quench the spirit. You say, well, I can't do things as well as others do. Don't worry about that. Just do the best you can do. And you mind God. And if the Holy Ghost says, amen, say amen. If the Holy Ghost says, take a walk around the tabernacle, then take a walk around the tabernacle. I mean, don't quench the spirit. Let go and let God have his way. If you feel like saying amen, say it. If you feel like saying praise God, say it. If you feel like taking a run, take a run. Let God have his wonderful, wonderful way. Let's give the Holy Ghost right away. If we want to get sanctified, let go and let God have his way. He's doing his best to help us. He's doing his best to get us to heaven. Let's walk in the light. Let's do what he says. And then he says, quench not the spirit. Then he says, despise not prophesying. And that means preaching, they tell me. Despise not preaching. Well, you say, I thought everybody loved preaching. All depends on what you call preaching is. I know the kind of preaching the old Dr. High Pockets over at the First Church of the Frigid Air, I know what kind of preaching he does. When he gives them a little, he gives a little sermon ad to a bunch of Christian ads who's on the way to heaven ad, and he's got to, he got to brag on them and keep them kind of encouraged and pumped up. So he, he, he begins his little dissertation to them and tells them how sweet they are and how well they're doing and how good they are. And he never says anything about hell if he's, if he said anything about hell, those that are half asleep would think he said all is well. And the other, and, and then he, he finally he, he spreads a little a little powder on them, as it were, and, and tells them how sweet they are and how good they are. And then finally he's closing. He's closing his little dissertation, his little sermonette. He's closing it. And he's had to quote them some portrait during the process of his dissertation. He says, Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as the snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And he just, those that weren't asleep, he was about to put the rest of them to sleep then. And finally, he feels like he better sprinkle a little stardust on them before he goes, before he closes out completely. And in his deep, melodious voice, he says, Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky. And he says amen. Dismisses them. And they all greet each other and smile and say, oh, isn't the old doctor wonderful? He's the best pastor we have ever had here. But you let a son of the prophet walk into that same pulpit and call sin, sin, and specify it and name it and see what kind of spirit they have. They'll go storming out with the spirit of hell in their heart. They don't want the old rugged gospel preached. The time has come, friend in our, friends, in our day when we ought to preach the old rugged gospel and let the people, whatever they do with it, it's up to them. It's up to me to try to do my best to give the gospel message such as people want to walk in the light, can't walk in the light. And those who want to do wrong will just have to do wrong, I reckon. I don't know how to help them. Oh, thank God. Thank God for the way of holiness. It's the best way there is. It's the only thing that's really worthwhile, friends, in our day that we live. Are we ready to let God Almighty have his wonderful, wonderful way in our midst? And then, looking back at the passage one more time. Abstain, approve all things, hold fast that which is good. Well, that's all right. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. One fellow said, blessed is the man that can eat chicken and spit out the bones. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 
I heard that one man took his family to, to, the, to the revival meeting, and the preacher preached on tithing. Right in the midst of a revival meeting, the preacher on tithing looked like the preacher no, he killed the meeting. But he preached on tithing right in the middle of the revival. And this, when the service was over, one man and his family went home. And on the way home, the father said, well, folks, and the preacher preached something I didn't know was in the Bible. But he said, we'll find out. And they got on home. They had their lunch. They all get their Bible going under the shade tree. And they get out there, and they run all the reference the preacher gave on tithing and read, read all the references they could find about it. And finally, the father closed his Bible and said, well, folks, I tell you, it's there. From now on, we'll be tithers. That's what I'm talking about. Prove all things. If it's not, if what I preach is not according to this book, you don't have to take it. Take the book. Take the book. That man did. He's willing to take what the Bible said. And he said, we'll be tithers. It's, right, it's beyond debate from this moment on. It's there. We'll, we'll take the way. And that's what we ought to do about holiness. If what I'm preaching is the right way, then we ought to say, this is the way I'm a-going. Right? Thank God, regardless of what my other kin folks do and the other people I know do, I'm a-going this way because I believe it'll get me to heaven. And I believe this will get us to heaven, friends. I'd be afraid of anything beside holiness, sanctification. I'd be afraid of anything to try to get to heaven with anything else less than holiness. Abstain from all the appearance of evil. And, and, one preacher was reading that passage and got down to this verse and said, and, and he kind of paused a moment and said, and, and said, what does and mean? And the, the preacher's little boy, the pastor's little boy was sitting on the front pew there. The little boy didn't want his daddy to get stalled and this little boy jumped and said, daddy said it. And means something else. It means something else. And, and, this is something else. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He's called you to holiness. God's not called us to uncleanness. He's called us to holiness. And since he's called us to holiness, he's faithful to keep his word. He'll do the work in your heart if you'll meet his conditions and let go and let him have his way. And you'll be glad forever and forever and forever that you settled it to go with God. Hallelujah. Praise God for the way of holiness. I believe this is the way to glory, friends. Oh, bless his name. Bless I appreciate the plan of redemption that God's made for us human beings. Let's take the way without debate. Let's take the way without, without hesitating. Just settle it to go with God. Settle it for time and settle for eternity. One glorious day, one glorious day, Jesus is coming. What a day that'll be. What a day that'll be when Jesus comes. Oh, friends. I'll tell you, we'll have a time for all eternity.